really, really happy that you guys have joined us tonight for this important program. Um, I'm Miriam Barry, and here we are talking about Are We Raising Robots? What Every Parent Needs to Know About Technology with Dr. Ellie Shapiro. Tonight's program is brought to you by the Search and MHR divisions of Sephardic Bikor Holim. What is Search? We provide educational advocacy services to the community through SBH. Our mission is to get our children through their schooling with their education and self-esteem intact. We navigate the DOE process with the parents, work with the schools and parents to create a plan for success. And we also provide programming like where relevant topics to our community's families that can increase their understanding and ability and ability to cope with the many issues we face in educating our children, especially now under these crazy circumstances. We have partnered with MHR Mental Health Referral, which is your go-to place when you need a therapist or a provider in the mental health field. Before we get to our renowned speaker, I do wanna tell you about a really wonderful program we have here at SEARCH called the Community, the Parent Engagement Center. We are able to provide free one-on-one -on -one counseling, no copay, no insurance for parents of children who are Title I eligible. Many parents are not aware that their children are Title I eligible. So if you think you're interested in speaking with a counselor one-on-one -on -one to talk about your child's school-related issues, please give us a call and we'll let you know if you qualify. A little housekeeping, there is a chat on the side. I don't know if we're gonna get to questions, but you can put in your questions. We can answer them as we go along if we're able to. Um, and if we're able to get to them a little later with Dr. Shapiro, we will. Um, so let me introduce our speaker tonight. Dr. Ellie Shapiro is a licensed clinical social worker with a doctorate in education. He has worked in New York, in New York area yeshivot for nearly 20 years, both in the classroom and in student support. He is a noted writer, lecturer, and consultant on child, family, and community matters. Dr. Shapiro developed the Digital Citizenship Project based upon his groundbreaking research in cyberbullying. The digital, citizen, citizenship, <clears throat> the digital Citizenship Project expands on traditional internet safety programs by educating students, parents, and school faculty on the inherent dangers of technology as it relates to the psychological, social, and behavior function of our kids. What he shares tonight, tonight can help us all navigate these treacherous digital waters. Thank you, Dr. Shapiro. Thank you. That was a, thank you, Mary. That was a fantastic introduction. Um, excellent research on that. Uh, I want to thank you. I want to thank Brooke. I want to uh, thank uh, SBA for putting this together uh, and giving me the opportunity to, uh, to speak with you all. Uh, it, unfortunately, it can't be in person. I, it was a couple of years ago, I, I got to uh, be in the community and, and meet people in person. Uh, but I guess this is the next best thing. Uh, let me just share my screen with you. And here we go, share, and let's play from the start. Okay, everybody can see the screen. Just give me a thumbs up if you can see it. Excellent. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna test my clicker, uh, but thank you everybody. And, and the first thing I wanna do is, you know, we're speaking about are we, are we raising robots um, and understanding technology's impact before, during, and after COVID. And Miriam really touched on a lot of the, of the issues I'm gonna, I'm gonna touch on. Um, and the first thing we need to recognize is that it's not about, um, second, make sure this is working. Okay, it's not just uh, about the internet, it's about technology as a whole. It's our relationship with technology. Uh, is it something that is productive and an enhancement in our lives or is it something that is really serving as an intrusion in our lives? And that's a question we have to ask ourselves all the time. Just by a raise of hands, I can see some of you, not all of you. Let me see if I can see more of you one second. Yeah, I can see a few more, okay. Um, by a raise of hands, how many of you experience what we call phantom vibrations? That's when your body's vibrating, but the phone isn't there. A few of you, right? So that really underscores our relationship with technology. And I refer to it as a relationship because some of us have healthier relationships and others have less healthy relationships. So that's how enmeshed the relationship is. Our body literally anticipates that vibration, that phone call, that text, that uh, WhatsApp message, so much so that we're literally feeling the vibrations. Um, this it's not working, so I'm going to do this by hand. Um, so, 
Uh, the truth is 89% of people experience phantom vibrations, uh, so don't feel bad. It's not just you. And uh, that really underscores our relationship uh, with technology, that it is one that is significant. It plays a significant role in our lives, in our children's lives who are growing up in this generation. And it's a, an issue that we need to address, and it's, it's a, something that we need to address regularly. Um, so we created something called the Digital Citizenship Project. Uh, I often get asked what it is. We started when Barack Obama was president. Uh, people thought it was a pathway to US citizenship using the internet. I used to get phone calls like that. Uh, that's not what it is. Uh, it is actually the norms of appropriate and responsible behavior when it comes to technology. So we created uh, the Digital Citizenship Project to educate, to educate parents, to educate teachers, to educate students on how to manage this whole new world of technology that we're living in and that is so much part of our lives. Um, we have specific challenges related to COVID. Uh, we have a complete restructure of education, of life, social distancing, elevated anxiety. Our overall uh, mood and our worry and uncertainty has increased significantly. And we have this shift to digital as well. Families that may have been utilizing some technology are now using a tremendous amount of technology. Other families that were not using technology, the next thing they know, they're, all of their kids are sitting in the living room on different devices and their bandwidth isn't good enough. We've learned terms that we never even thought we would be utilizing. Um, you know, a colleague of mine said he found it interesting that on his kindergartner's report card, uh, it was graded that she knows how to mute and unmute herself on her own. So that became an area of grading. So all of a sudden, these things that we've never thought about before, this significant shift to digital technology, both in the educational realm and the recreational realm, uh, has increased significantly. And one of the things that we often look for is what I call the magic pill. The magic pill is just that simple answer, you know, what age should I get my child a smartphone or what filter should I get? And we need to recognize that technology is a much more complex issue. It's a much more challenging uh, concept and we can't utilize very simplistic solutions for complex issues. And so tonight we're gonna talk about the complexity of technology, get a better understanding of it so we can make more informed decisions in our own homes. Okay, so I often refer to technology as the best of times and the worst of times. Uh, a, uh, Charles Dickens, he wrote a book, uh, Tale of Two Cities, said it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. Uh, and if we ever lived in a time where we had the age of wisdom and the age of foolishness, now it is. Uh, technology is amazing. It offers us accessibility, productivity, information, connectivity. Our ability right now to connect and talk about these issues is a part of the benefit of technology. Can you imagine what this global pandemic would have been like if we didn't have technology? Uh, not just from an educational standpoint, but from a connect from a social standpoint. If many of us have family overseas, who would have ever thought we couldn't get on a plane and go to Canada or go to to Israel? Who would have ever thought that would happen? And all of a sudden we find ourselves in a situation where we can't and our only way of connecting is via technology. So it's amazing, it's wonderful, it's fantastic, but it is also the worst of times. And we're seeing how technology is negatively impacting our socialization, our behavior. Uh, psychologically, we are impacted by technology and then some of the day-to-day -day challenges that present itself as well. So our goal is to understand some of these challenges uh, so we can better guide our children, guide our own families, and create an environment where we're maximizing all the awesomeness that technology has to offer and avoiding those inherent challenges. I have a confession to make. Uh, I love technology. If you share that with me, raise your hand as well. How awesome is technology? I see some people are iffy about it. We got, must have a few out there that love it. Well, a lot of you are on a uh, screensaver, so I can't see, but oh, I see a bunch of raised hands. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so I was feeling a little lonely for a second there. Uh, yeah, technology is awesome. I love it. Uh, and the world really loves technology. If you look at the research, uh, the UN did a study a number of years ago, the 6 billion out of the world, 7 billion people own a mobile phone, but only 4.5 million people have a toilet. So when you think about what the priorities are, uh, what is important, clearly uh, the toilet uh, supersedes the 
Uh, yeah, the cell phone smartphone to supersedes the toilet. We also have, and I was talking to Miriam about this earlier, we have something called the generational disconnect. Hold on. Um, that uh, we, we see that the younger generation seems to be more savvy and more informed about technology than we are. In fact, this text between a mother and child, your great aunt just passed away, LOL. Why is that funny? It's not funny, David. What do you mean? Mom, LOL means laughing out loud. Oh my goodness, I sent that to everyone. I thought it meant lots of love. A little awkward, uh, but we're all there. We're all in situations where we don't quite get the lingo. We, we don't quite understand what our kids are talking about. Uh, and it is incumbent upon us to really have a better understanding of that. The good news is we know things that our kids don't know. They do not know what this is. See, most of you do, I hope. Uh, they don't know what this is. They definitely don't know the relationship between these two items. I see some of the younger participants here don't know either. You can ask anyone with some gray hair uh, to explain it. Um, this was a lot of my adolescence, uh, these two items together. So uh, we do have some things up on our kids, but clearly we do have a uh, generational disconnect that presents a challenge in managing technology. 95% of teens, oh, but just before I go on, I just wanna share that I do have a lot of data and statistics in my presentations. Um, some of my audiences say that I have too much uh, data and statistics in my presentations. Um, actually, about 75% of my audience say too much data and statistics. But nonetheless, I think it's important that we utilize data to inform practice. Um, you know, it, it should inform it. It shouldn't define it. Uh, informing means we can glean from it and learn from it. Defining it is like my brother-in-law when he's, he was expecting his fifth child, he decorated the baby's room in an Asian theme because he read a study that every fifth child born in America is Asian. So that is not using data appropriately, that, that is misguided, but we can use it to help inform what we do. So 95% of teens own or have access to a smartphone. That was a 2008 study by Pew and the majority of them by the age of 11. It's interesting in, in my work, you know, we started talking about ninth graders and, and smartphones uh, a number of years ago. And now I'm seeing second graders and first graders already with smartphones. So it's getting younger and younger, the ownership and the access to devices. Um, social networking is huge. These three, these four, uh, Instagram, WhatsApp, uh, Snapchat and TikTok are heavily used social networking platforms that is really something that kids are engaged with pretty heavily uh, and involves a lot of their time. 90% of teens are active users of social media. Um, and uh, what we're seeing is that it becomes something that they are dependent on. The relationship is slightly different for boys and girls. Uh, girls utilize technology in general for socialization, while boys tend to use it for entertainment. So there are nuanced differences in how we approach boys and girls with technology, but they are both definitely using so social media pretty heavily. Gaming is a big deal, um, particularly with boys, but with girls as well. Uh, we have all different sorts of games uh, from games that I get, the content is relatively okay, like Mario or Madden Sports. Um, or even games like Minecraft, but then you have more aggressive games with content that should concern parents uh, with games like uh, Grand Theft Auto or Call of Duty. These games present content issues as far as graphic violence, et cetera. Uh, but it's not just about the content, it's about the behavior and the amount of time kids are. Even if you're spending, um, you know, even if you're playing a relatively a uh, mild content game, let's just say like Mario Brothers um, or Madden Sports, uh, you know, if you're spending more than two and a half hours a day playing video games, that's a bit much. And we see consequences in other areas as well. So understanding the role of the content in video game play, as well as how it might be impacting uh, overall functioning uh, is something we need to be aware of. Here is a uh, young man who, uh, you'll notice the truck behind him is flipped over. He was in a tornado and the news is interviewing him after uh, the tornado. Um, I was sitting at home and I was playing Fortnite and all of a sudden I just hear a bunch of noise and I look out the window and I start seeing the roof come off the houses in front of me. But then I sit back down because I only got like a couple people left in my gang. I was going to try to finish the game. And, and what's going through your mind is you're, you're, you said you're in the bathroom with your sister and nephew. I'm like... 
<laughs> Honestly, I was just thinking about the game. So Anton Williams, you see, uh, clearly has uh, overdependence on technology, on gaming, that even during a tornado, all he can think about is the game. Uh -huh. Um, video watching, we have so many platforms. It seems that new platforms are coming out every day. Um, you know, Netflix, the most popular ones are certainly Netflix, YouTube, um, and Prime are probably the three most popular, but uh, Disney Plus, uh, Hulu uh, are growing as well. And even in families where technology is not as heavily used, where there might be less device ownership or less social media, we are still seeing very high rates of uh, video watching. 69% um, of teens are watching more than one hour a day of video. And we find uh, the research more than seven hours daily of non-school related screen use. So that's a tremendous amount of non-school related screen time. And we're gonna talk about that distinction as well, the difference between uh, recreational uh, technology use and academic technology use. Okay, so we, we, social media, devices, videos, gaming are all part of our kids' lives in pretty significant ways, and adults, by the way. Uh, but we're seeing it impacting uh, behavioral, the behavioral, social, psychological, and day-to-day -day domains. And we will uh, now go into each one of these in a little more depth. So um, in the behavioral realm, we see dependence, distraction, impulsivity, disinhibition, sleep. These are core areas. I think dependence and distraction, intuitively, we see a lot of both in our kids and ourselves. But impulsivity, disinhibition, and sleep are three areas that don't get as much attention, but I think are of critical importance. Uh, impulsivity is doing something without thinking about the potential con consequences of of our, our behavior. So um, I've been fortunate to uh, collect data. Some of the data that I, I quote is from other people. Some of the data is my own. Uh, this happens to be my own. Um, I, I've surveyed close to four or 5,000 kids across North America, as well as parents, Jewish day school and yeshiva parents, about 2,500. And 39% um, of students admit to having emailed or texted something that they later regretted, which is a pretty significant amount. That's impulsivity, not thinking about the consequences of what you put out there. And it's pretty amazing that 39% of kids had that self-awareness to be able to say, uh, I shouldn't have done that. Really, 80, 90% of kids have sent things out that they should regret. They may just may not have that level of awareness. So there's something about technology that makes us more impulsive. When I was a kid, if I was angry at someone, we'd say, you know, write them a letter, uh, put it in an envelope, wait a week, and by the time you're ready to send it, usually the issue has resolved itself. But today, when we're upset about something, we tweet, we post, we blog, we comment, right? We email, we text, we message, any way that we can get that out as quickly as possible. So there's inherently something about technology that promotes impulsivity. And it's not just limited to kids, adults as well. Uh, more than half of adults uh, also have posted something that they later regretted, and 22% uh, report doing so weekly. So there's something that relationship between impulsivity and technology, you give children a device, they tend to be more impulsive anyway, from a brain developmental standpoint, they just don't have that self-regulation, self-control. And you know, giving them a device that promotes impulsivity can create problematic behavior moving forward. Online disinhibition, that's when we behave differently online than we do in face-to-face -face conversations. We will do and say things differently online. There's a perceived anonymity. There's a perception that even though the person may know who it is that they're speaking to, we know that people are more likely to do or say things online than they would in a face-to-face -face conversation. And at a minimum, you can uh, identify it. You know, when you're supposed, you need to tell someone something that may be uncomfortable and you say, you know what, I'm just gonna text them. The reason it's more comfortable to text them is because of online disinhibition. But online disinhibition and impulsivity amongst kids can you know, create problems for them moving forward. Another issue, so we talked about uh, impulsivity and we've talked about uh, disinhibition. Another issue, particularly for kids, uh, is uh, sleep. Uh, devices create and uh, disturb and, and, and create challenges, both falling asleep and the quality of sleep. Artificial light from the phones actually uh, impact melatonin production in the brain, which is what helps us sleep. Um, and vibrating noises from the phone or that phantom vibration, that anticipation that we're gonna get an important message at some point in the night impacts the quality of our sleep. And so recognizing the role that 
phones uh, and devices may have on the quality of sleep uh, is really important. For children, the greatest predictor of them being able to maximize their day in school, both academically and socially, is the quality of sleep they had the night before. And so recognizing that most, most kids that have devices sleep with the devices within reach, you ask parents why, and they'll say, well, their children say they need an alarm clock. And so there are better ways. Let me show you what I have right here. Let me see if you can see it. I got one of these guys, right? Um, that works better as an alarm clock and you don't run the risk of your kids not sleeping well. So that's something to keep in mind. So sleep is something that we should be very focused on. 77% of kids report going to bed late. If there's one thing you walk away with tonight, uh, helping our kids get a good night's sleep, uh, should really be a priority for all of us. All right, so that's uh, on the uh, behavioral domain. Socially, we see digital distraction, social dependence, online aggression, cyberbullying, miscommunication, all these issues in the social realm. We see scenes like this all the time, uh, you know, where we are not engaged with each other. I call it a regression to parallel play. Preschoolers or preschool parents, you know, when your kids like are playing next to each other, but not with each other. So even as adults, we've kind of regressed to that a little bit. Uh, and it has impacted the quality of our social interactions. UCLA did a fascinating study where they measured people's uh, middle schoolers' ability to read facial expressions and social cues, um, and then they sent them to sleepaway camp without any technology. So they got a baseline, they took the measurements, they sent them to sleepaway camp and they checked them again. What they found was that after only five days away from technology, their ability to read facial expressions and social cues and form meaningful social connections vastly improved. And so uh, it's a fascinating study. It teaches us two things. One is that digital technology is having a negative impact on the quality of our relationships. Uh, and this doesn't just apply to kids. It applies to adults as well. The quality of our relationships have been diminished as a result of technology, but we can repair. Uh, we can repair those relationships and those, th those connections by, um, we can repair those connections by, um, taking breaks from technology. So if I were to ask you, when do we best connect with uh, our friends and with our family, with our children? The Shabbos, right? Because we don't have the technology. So that ability to make that connection, we can do that. In my own home, we do something called going dark for dinner during the week. Um, during the week, we, uh, we have no technology at the dinner table. And we also we can replicate that level of quality interaction uh, in our home, even during the week. Uh, when I go out with my friends, we, we do this, we do the phone stacking method where we uh, stack our phones in the middle of the table. Whoever grabs their phone first has to pay for dinner. Um, and what I do is, I'm going to tell you a little secret. I don't know if it got to your community yet. So you in, always invite someone who is addicted to their phone. And this way, they, I have this one friend, he's paid for dinner for the last three years and he hasn't figured it out yet. Uh, so the quality of the interaction is good and someone else is paying for dinner. It's a win-win if you ask me. Um, okay. Miscommunication. There's something about the digital realm that takes away the majority of communication, which is paraverbal. Paraverbal is our body language, our tone, our volume, intonation, everything but the words themselves. In fact, the research indicates that the words are only about 20% of communication. Everything else, um, everything else is, uh, is the other 80% is what I just mentioned. So when you see a word like this, you're all thinking about it differently in your head. So some of you might say that, you know, whatever, you know, it's all, it's all good. Or it could be whatever. I'm Dr. Shapiro, you're muted. Okay. Okay. Am I still so, muted? No, no, you're good now. Okay. Um, so, so the eighty percent of communication is paraverbal. Twenty percent is a verbal. So on a Friday night, after you wash for hamotzi, before you have the bread, right? You have entire conversations without actually saying a single word. Uh huh. New. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Right. So we, we know that we can. So the words are the smallest part of the communication. What ends up happening in the digital realm is all we have are the words. We only have the 20 percent. Sometimes we have emojis that are a little helpful, but overall we have miscommunications. And what we have seen is in, in many uh, cyberbullying cases, it starts from a miscommunication. It starts from a misunderstanding. 59% of kids report having been the victims of cyberbullying. We see similar rates in the yeshiva day school community as well. And all of this stems from everything we've talked about so far, impulsivity, disinhibition, uh, uh, miscommunication, all these areas 
uh, around digital technology promote this negative, aggressive, confrontational behavior. And so understanding that and communicating that to our kids becomes really uh, uh, an important part of parenting piece when, you know, when we're giving our kids devices, helping them to understand impulsivity, disinhibition, miscommunication, all these areas uh, become very important. All right, so we talked about behavioral, we've talked about social, let's talk about psychological. We see a relationship between anxiety, depression, isolation, addiction, and uh, excessive and over-dependence on technology. You know, we've all been there where we forgot our phone at home. And it's like, oh, I forgot my phone at home. No one can get in touch with me. And we like sort of panic, that level of anxiety uh, hits us. And, uh, you know, those of us that are moderately well-adjusted, it goes from, oh my gosh, I forgot my phone at home. No one, no one can get in touch with me to, I forgot my phone at home and no one can get in touch with me. And then like a calm comes over, a peace, a menuchas and nefesh that we experience on Shabbos, where all of a sudden we're at peace and we're not tethered to our devices. But that anxiety, that elevated feeling of dependence and connectivity and tethering to the device really is a challenge for many people. Um, and teens as well, you know, they've been, this study has been uh, replicated many times. They ask teenagers and college students, how do you feel about your phone? And of course they say it enhances their lifestyle. It's to keep their social life. It's so important. And they ask them to rate the importance of their devices. And what they find is that the more important they rate their phones, the higher their levels of anxiety tend to be, the lower their levels of subjective well-being, meaning they're less happy and the lower their academic performance is as well. So <clears throat> we mentioned the relationship with technology. The stronger, more dependent your relationship is with technology, the more likely you are to also have elevated anxiety, elevated depression, and lower academic performance, lower work performance as well for adults. And so really uh, assessing your own relationship or your children's relationship with technology becomes a key part of parenting children. You will note that your children all have different relationships. Some of your kids are more dependent on their devices and some of your kids are less dependent on their devices. There's just a personality type. And I will tell you that if your kids, if your younger kids are prone to anxiety or prone to depression and particularly social anxiety, uh, they are more likely to develop an unhealthy relationship with technology and it's something to be aware of um, as you make the decision whether or not to give them devices and what kind of rules and guidelines to set for them. Uh, this is a hashtag. It reminds me uh, to share with you a study by two of my favorite psychologists, Peterson and Seligman. They did something called the positive journaling study where they uh, had a group write at the end of each day five things that they were grateful for. Um, and what they found was that this group had elevated levels of, sub of subjective well-being. They were a happier group because they expressed gratitude and they expressed positivity. Uh, the flip side is true as well. When we, we share negative things and we express negativity, we are less happy. And so what ends up happening uh, in the digital realm, if I were to ask you, are you more likely to share positive things or negative things? Are you more likely to post positive things or negative things? Well, here's an example. If Delta gets you to your destination on time with your luggage, are you more likely to tweet about that? Or are you more likely to tweet about, you know, getting there six hours late and your luggage was somewhere else? Which are you more likely to tweet about? So it's the negative. Are you more likely to share a story about someone who gave a donation to a community uh, a community organization, or are you more likely to share a, a new story about someone who embezzled money from the community organization? And so what we find consistently is our default is uh, sharing negative and posting negative. In fact, a recent study on hashtags, um, comparing positive hashtags to negative, for every positive hashtag, there were two negative hashtags. And so this is our default. We need to be aware of how technology uh, is impacting our own behavior and our well-being. Because if we are engaging in posting negative or being aggressive online or sharing negative articles, that literally will impact our subjective well-being and puts a negative schema and we see things in a negative light. So we often partake in our own negativity online. Uh, we also have the opportunity to flip it around by focusing on sharing positive and posting positive. And that's something we need to encourage our kids to do as well. 70% um, of kids, and again, these are the kids reporting, 70% of kids report using technology longer than they intended. What does that mean for the kids? Kids 
uh, have a much more difficult time being able to self-regulate their technology use. And therefore it's incumbent upon us, the adults, to help regulate it for them. But how do they feel when they can't regulate their own technology. So let's say they come home from school and they say, okay, I have homework, I have a big test I have to study for, but I'm gonna play 15 minutes of video games, right? Or I'm gonna watch uh, one episode of a show, 20 minute episode. And then, you know, four hours later, they're still on the device and then they didn't do what they were supposed to do. They don't feel good about themselves. And that also has an impact on their uh, overall well-being. So we don't want to put our kids in that situation in giving them, putting them in an environment where they can't regulate their own habits. And so it, uh, it becomes incumbent upon us to help them regulate. Uh, I love this slide. Uh, my daughter made it for me. Um, but the dependence that younger kids start having on devices, I don't know if we have uh, parents of uh, early childhood here, but I will just mention that if we have some grandparents of early childhood here, um, uh, the Formative years of one through five are so critical in development. And unfortunately, we are exposing our kids to way more screen time than they should be exposed to. Uh, preschool development, uh, we see attachment, which should be to parents, end up being on devices, regulation, dependence, learning. All of this becomes part of the uh, early childhood experience. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends under 18 months to avoid screen time and two to five years uh, under one hour a day. The vast majority of kids are exceeding that daily recommended screen time, 87%, um, which creates problems. And I just want to give you two quick examples of where this becomes problematic. Let's say you take your three-year-old uh, to the doctor and they need to get a shot which is not uncommon. So you're, they, they get a shot and they're crying. What do many parents do to calm them down? They give them their phone. And what does that teach our, 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 our child? It teaches them that in order to self-soothe, you need a screen, you need a device. And where they're basically learning this at a very young age in where they should be learning their ability to self-soothe or the parental role in helping them calm down. The parent needs to hug the child, to rub the child, to help them calm down. That creates the relationship attachment. But if you give them the device, they are learning very quickly at a young age that that is what calms them down. And so we end up creating a high degree of dependence on technology because we're giving our kids the very devices to calm them down. Uh, they're learning a valuable lesson that becomes problematic, that they are uh, they are calmed down by the technology. The other piece of it is when we see young kids, uh, one-year-olds, even two-year-olds, trying to get their parents' attention and the parents are on their devices and they're distracted and they're not noticing or seeing that their child in the high chair is trying to get their attention. What happens, you can see, there's been studies on this, one of them called the still face experiment, where you see the stress levels of the child elevate significantly when they're not getting the responses from the parents that they need. And so that dynamic, both giving the children the devices to self-soothe and to occupy them and the parental distraction because of the technology uh, is also having a significant impact. And these ages, one to five years old, it's a critical stage of development that they are being impacted by technology habits. So it's something to keep in mind uh, at that age group as well. Early exposure to inappropriate websites, graphic violence, et cetera, can result in emotional distress and uh, impact psychological well being of children. Uh, we need to protect our kids. And it's not just about the filters, filters are important, but even the regular you know, news stories, even on the quote unquote kosher websites, you, know, you have CCTV footage of a mugging or a stabbing, or you have, um, you have uh, uh, police dash cam videos that show car crashes, things like that is very disturbing content for a child. Even uh, you know, uh, recent uh, political events uh, some of the video footage was very disturbing. And that's not something that a filter is going to block, uh, but we need to help protect our kids from such content that they find uh, emotionally distressing. In the uh, students that I surveyed, uh, uh, this number is about 2,000 fifth through eighth graders. 63% of kids reported having been disturbed by an image uh, or a video clip. So that's 63% of, of little kids, fifth to eighth grade, that report having a negative emotional response to content that they saw online. 
42% have looked up a website their parents would disapprove of, and 57% of kids have accidentally ended up on websites their parents would disapprove of. So we've talked about social, we've talked about psychological, we've talked about uh, behavioral. We also see issues around day-to-day uh, -day schoolwork, exposure, physical health, uh, criminal charges, college employment. Um, you know, I can't stress en enough the role that your digital footprint plays in future opportunities. Um, whether it's uh, college or job opportunities, um, or even in, in uh, matchmaking in Shaduchim, people look into you and your digital footprint, what it says about you, what it says about your family. And the people post things and they say things that really uh, cut out opportunities for them down the road. So even if you, know, you have a very strong opinion on, on something, uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be shared online if you don't think it really reflects well upon you. Uh, but because of impulsivity, because of disinhibition, we use it as a um, an open form, a blank canvas to share our opinions. But ultimately, it can have negative consequences if someone who might potentially be hiring us doesn't share the same views as us. And do, you know, what benefit does it really have when I post these things? So we need to be thoughtful and deliberative and, and be very careful with the things we post because our digital footprints, what we do, what we say, where we go online, it all ends up being part of our online profile. In fact, not too long ago, Harvard rescinded 10 acceptance letters for students that posted offensive comments and memes in a private Facebook group. And this was a private Facebook group. It wasn't even a public like Twitter. Uh, so we see that the consequences are real. Do they have freedom of speech? Absolutely. You can say what you want uh, wherever you want. However, people can also formulate opinions about you and make decisions based on, those, uh, based on what you've posted. So it's important to keep those in mind. Uh, one of the things we need to help our kids understand is that everything they do online is public and permanent. Every device has an IP address. Uh, sorry, every device has a Mac ID. Every uh, network has an IP address. Most of them can be uh, do a reverse lookup, which is what I, I'm showing over here. Uh, and we actually give you a GPS location of a device based on um, what, you, uh, what you post. So when you go shopping for a pair of shoes, for example, all of a sudden you find in your social media, your email, everything popping up these same pair of shoes. How does everybody know about it? Because the companies are able to track you and Amazon has your IP address, your Mac ID, your, your email address, your home address. And so we have to assume that everything we do online is public and permanent um, and help our kids understand that as well. Um, in technology by the numbers, I've you know, uh, looked at some of the data that parents share and some of the data that kids share. 91% of parents say there are set rules in their house. 91% uh, is a great number. The only issue is that only 41% uh, of students say that there are set rules in their house. 89% of parents report having had conversations about using the internet responsibly, yet only 31% of kids say that, uh, that their parents have spoken with them. 22% of parents report that their kids have been disturbed by online video and content, uh, but we know that 63%. So we see a disconnect um, between you know, parents' perception of how they are engaging their children with technology and children's perception with how their parents are engaging with them in technology. An interesting study out of England, uh, six out of 10 parents were concerned about their children's technology use, but seven out of 10 children were concerned about their parents' technology use. So we have to have that, that dialogue, that understanding uh, with our children and with ourselves about responsible technology use. But I was wondering why is it that kids don't, uh, don't get it? Like parents, I don't assume parents are lying when they fill out surveys. So why is it that um, kids don't seem to get what their parents have uh, conveyed to them. So uh, I just wanted to do a test. Uh, I always felt that this public speaking gig didn't work out. I would be a mentalist. Mentalist is, you know, you can look at people and know what they're thinking. Uh, so let's do a, a quick exercise. I can see most of you. Um, so you can either mouth the answers um, or you can hold up, you know, with your hands what the answers might be. Um, so I'm going to ask a question. It's a little harder over Zoom uh, to be a mentalist, but we're going to try. Thank you, those of you that turned your cameras on. Um, and uh, we'll test this out. I'm gonna ask you a question. You are all gonna say in unison the answer and um, we'll see if I get it right, it'll appear on the screen as well, okay? Let's test this out. What is one plus one? I heard two. Oh man, missed a slide there. 
Um, okay, so your child comes home from school. Missing a slide. Um, your child comes home from school. Uh, you say, how was your day? They respond, good, fine, right? They respond, good, fine. And um, the really good parents follow up with the following question of what did you do today? Let me hear you in unison. What did you do today? Nothing. That's when most kids respond. Yeah, we go through this dialogue with our kids fairly regularly. How's your day? Uh, fine. What did you do today? Nothing. Mommy, where's the iPad? So we are having these dialogues that don't really express the expectations. It's very hard to, to have communicate about technology, complex issues around technology and expectations, when often that's the extent of the conversation. Sometimes on Shabbos, when we're not distracted by technology, we have more meaningful conversations. But overall, what we're seeing is these sort of conversations. And in order for us to make a meaningful impact on our kids around technology, we have to focus on more meaningful conversations. So what can we do? Um, as parents to better manage. We talked about the social, psychological, behavioral, day-to-day -day impact around technology. We've talked about the disconnect between parents and kids and how they feel, um, how they feel uh, technology is in their house and the rules and the guidelines. So what can we do as parents to address all these and help raise our children in this challenging time? The first thing we have to do is, as we started with, recognize that there is no magic pill and that it's going to take multiple strategies in order to help our kids be successful with technology. We can't just say, I'm going to wait to give them a device till they're you know, 35. We can't just say no video games. We can't just say, uh, which filter should I get? It really has to be a multi-pronged approach to managing our children's technology. But rule number one, above everything else, every house, you have to have rules around technology. And it's almost secondary what the rules are. But it, you know, examples of rules might be uh, no technology a half hour before bedtime, no technology at the dinner table. Uh, technology when it's being used is in a public place. Uh, one hour an evening of video games or a half hour of video games or whatever the number is. It's just important to have the rules. Uh, when you're on technology in your room, the door needs to be open. Whatever the rules are, what we're doing is we are teaching our children that there are expectations around technology and how we use technology, when we use technology, and discussing those expectations. So rule number one is have rules. Only 41% of kids say that there are set rules in their house. And so we, we, we want to be part of that percentage. We want to be uh, part of the percentage where uh, you know, kids know that there are rules in the house. Rule number two, we have to actually discuss the rules. Oftentimes when I sit with parents and I ask them like, yeah, sure, we have rules. Uh, the kids know they can't play video games at night and the kids know that no videos during the week. The kids know that, but the kids don't know that because we haven't actually discussed it with them. In our heads, that's what we want. And we think we may have conveyed it. Sometimes we'll yell at our kids and we'll say, you know, you should know there's no video games uh, or there's no movies during the weeknight. And so it's important to have these conversations to discuss the rules that they, they are aware and they are clear that there are rules. And it's not just that, um, you know, we have the rules in our head. And so that's rule number two. Rule number three, we have to keep the rules. And that, that's probably the hardest part. Keeping the rules becomes really challenging because there's always going to be a reason why the rule doesn't apply in this situation. And our kids are very good at figuring out what the reason is. There's always going to be like, well, obviously on a Wednesday night when, uh, you know, we're off on Friday because Monday's a holiday, obviously the rules don't apply then, right? And then we all, they always come up with these reasons. Well, I got a hundred on a test yesterday. So obviously the rules don't apply today. So keeping the rules becomes a challenge. So rule number one, having rules. Rule number two, discussing the rules. Rule number three, uh, keeping the rules uh, becomes part of the strategy. Another important piece as parents, we need to know the devices that we're giving our kids. We have to know how they work. We have to know, we can't just give our kids a device and say, well, I'm not technically savvy. Okay, so, David. Um, we can't just give our kids a device and say, well, I'm not technically savvy. I don't know how an iPhone works. So, um, you know, that's it. We have to know. Uh, we have to know the content, the apps, the games that we're giving them. We have to know about them. We should never give our kids a game or an app if we haven't looked into it. One of the great uh, websites of looking into games, apps, videos is something called Con you're muted again for some reason. 
Um, one of the websites that I highly recommend is Common Sense Media. Uh, you can find out about games and videos and, and books and, uh, and, and apps, and it's all rated by parents. So they, you, know, uh, you have a better understanding of it and what the concerns might be with specific apps. Development, your own child's development, their personality, uh, and their relationship, what their relationship is going to be with the technology. All of that goes into good parenting around technology. So it's having rules, discussing the rules, keeping the rules, but also knowing the devices that you're giving your kids, the content you're making available to them, as well as the developmental appropriateness. One quick way of doing this, uh, when, you, when your child says they want a certain app, if you go to the app store, there's always a page like this before you actually download it. Uh, so if you look, it says Snapchat is rated 12 plus. I can't tell you how many parents of eight year olds and 10 year olds come to me and say, oh, my kid's on Snapchat and it's really not working out well for them. Well, not even Snapchat believes that a 10 year old should be using it. Uh, but then when you look to the right as to uh, why it's rated 12 plus, and you see the reasons, drug use, crude humor, suggestive themes, mild sexual content and nudity, you probably don't want that for your 12 year old either. So keeping that in mind, you wanna be an educated consumer before making things available to your children. So if they say, I want Snapchat, everyone has it. If they say, I want TikTok, everyone has it. First of all, be sure that everyone has it, but more than that is do your own research, become educated on the content the devices, the content, et cetera, that you're making available to your children. Now, um, my son, one of the things that we can do with our kids is actually join them in technology activities. And it's a great way to uh, bridge the gap between uh, that generational disconnect that we referred to earlier. My son likes to play sports video games. Um, from a content standpoint, I don't have an issue with it. I try to regulate the amount of time he spends on it. Uh, and overall look at the broad picture of how things are going for him. But if I play video games with him, it actually becomes not about the technology. It actually becomes a parental child bonding experience. It happens to be the medium that we're using as technology. So this is actually the joystick that I am used to. That is the old Atari 2600 joystick that I grew up playing video games on. And uh, he actually is used to this video. Um, this controller. And so he beats me every time and he loves it. And it's a great opportunity for us to spend together. So you can actually share the technology experience with your children. And it, it sort of takes it out of the realm of technology and it becomes more of a bonding experience. Now that shouldn't be the only point of connection with your children. You need to find activities that are non uh, digital non-screen related, but to understand that you can utilize it, have your children teach you about uh, you know, the social media that they're using uh, that you're, uh, you've accepted or the games that they like to play or how they're engaged on YouTube. Like my son, um, you know, follows uh, certain people on YouTube. I know who they are. We sometimes watch it together. Uh, and that's part of sharing with your children about in, within their technology experience. Some of the challenges we face as parents, I think the biggest ones, FOMO, fear of missing out, and bet, which is what I call, but everyone has. I think it's the biggest challenge for parents. It's not the Ezra Hashem uh, that uh, you might be thinking, but bet, but everyone has, our kids come home, but everyone has this, but everyone has that. It creates a real challenge for parents. It's not only uh, children that experience this. I'm gonna just play this short video about what happens when monkeys uh, see when other monkeys have stuff that they don't have, how they react. So a final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, this, this became a very famous study and there's now many more because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys and uh, I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs and with birds and with chimpanzees. Um, this, but with Sarah Brosnan, we started out with capuchin monkeys. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber <laughs> is perfectly fine for them. Now if you give the partner grapes, the, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes, it's a far better food uh, than you create inequity between them. 
So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, uh, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, and then she sees the other one getting grape, and <coughs> you can see what happens. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task, and we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us, and that's what she does. And she gets a grape, <coughs> and she eats it. The other one sees that, she gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. She tests a rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. <laughs> so this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. All right, so what we see here is that when kids see other kids get stuff, they want it. Same thing with monkeys, it's just a natural instinct. But we, within a community, there's power in numbers. We have the opportunity to influence what the social norms are, particularly in school communities. When I do work with schools, uh, one of the things that we try to do from a, a policy standpoint or a guidance standpoint is to create norms where there isn't that competitive piece, where everyone's not getting the latest device or the latest video games. It becomes a point of conversation amongst the parents to determine uh, what it is that they want to see for their school community. So whether it comes to apps and social media, maximum recreation uh, screen time, or one of the most important, in my opinion, is ideal shutoff time. Imagine if in your child's school community, uh, the eighth grade agreed, the eighth grade parents agreed that 9 p.m. would be the shutoff time for technology, or 10 p.m. It doesn't really matter what time it is, as long as there is a set time Kids don't feel that FOMO. Kids don't feel that, but everyone has experience because they know that all their friends are shutting down the technology at the same time. And it's something that in smaller communities or in school communities is something that we can do effectively. Only 42% of uh, families that we've surveyed have filtered on all the devices available to kids. Um, and so if we want to express the expectations of what our kids should or shouldn't be doing online, part of that is having filters on devices. I'm often asked to recommend uh, what filters. So um, the, the, the first thing I always recommend is Apple products, anything made by Apple, uh, not just because I'm a shareholder, that's, that's one reason I recommend it, but uh, reason number two is that they have the best native restriction and device management software than any other device. Um, there's a screen time feature within all Apple products that allows you to set the amount of screen time, it allows you to set which apps are available for how long, uh, it uh, allows you to have a browser, not have a browser, something called a whitelist browser that only allows you to access pre-approved websites. So I recommend Apple products. Those of you that don't have Apple products, there are uh, other features like NetSpark is a filter or OurPack is a device management, but uh, most communities have a technology awareness group tag that uh, they're great at guiding people on, uh, on what filters for their needs and for their devices. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, contract setting, when your children are begging you for a device or a, in this case, a smartphone, this is my daughter was, I, I, everyone has an iPhone, everyone has an iPhone, everyone has an iPhone. I was hearing that for a couple of years. Finally, legitimately, everyone had an iPhone. And so I sat her down, I gave her this presentation that you've just sat through. I gave her the, the three hour version instead of the one hour version. And um, we basically, I presented all my concerns, social, psychological, behavioral, day to day. And I said, you come up with rules that will make me comfortable with giving you an iPhone. And so she came up with her draft. I revised it, sent it back to her. She reviewed it with her people. Her people sent it back to my people. We went through this process and ultimately we came up with a contract and the process was so important uh, we had a contract, but the process was really the, the key part 
where she was very clear what my expectations are. There was no question about that. And so I recommend that, you know, going through this process with your children is one that will yield great results for their technology habits later on. All of this assumes that we have good relationships with our children. Uh, you know, it's, it's really critical. We have different styles of parenting. The three major styles of parenting are um, authoritarian, authoritative, and laissez-faire. Uh, authoritarian is where we just rules and we don't explain and we're the parents and that becomes challenging because, you know, they will push back on that. Laissez-faire is when we say whatever, they, they can do what they want. The ideal balance is where you are both uh, expressing love and, and explanation with rules, limits, and guidelines. So that's the research uh, across the board finds that to be the, the ideal parenting style. And so the relationship is critical because you can set rules and set limits much more effectively when there's a positive relationship. Um, and it's not just about technology with this, it's about all aspects of parenting. Uh, really, we need to focus on those relationships and, and communication. 51% of the kids that I've surveyed say their parents are the number one influence on what they think is appropriate with technology. And it's not that there are competing, aren't competing influences, there are, but parents consistently, both in my research and in other research, come up as the number one influence. So we, we can't forget what our role is. And our role is not just about telling kids, it's also modeling uh, the appropriate behavior as well, and really finding that balance. You know, we live in this time, we live in COVID, we, we have these challenges around technology, increased uh, technology use, and we need to find balance. And the way to find balance is through a thoughtful and deliberative approach of thinking about it, of, of coming up with guidelines, policies when it comes to technology. The question I get, yes, come up with balance, be thoughtful, deliberative, but how much is too much? How much screen time is too much screen time. We always read these articles and see stories. And the answer is that screen time in and of itself is a misconception. We tend to think of screen time as this one thing, but I've actually created something called the five C's of screen time, consumption, complementary, consumerism, uh, communication, and creative. And these are all qualitatively very different screen time engagements. Consumption, um, is the most basic type of screen time. That's the Netflix binging, when you're just sitting back and just consuming uh, entertainment content that is the least productive and least healthy. Uh, and then let's jump all the way to creative. Uh, creative is distance learning, is schoolwork, it's, it's creating video content, graphic design. Uh, it's a positive screen experience. So the amount of time spending being creative is clearly gonna be different than the amount of time spending consuming something. And as parents, we need to recognize that there are different types of screen time and really balancing it out. The balancing comes by understanding the different types of screen time and understanding your specific child, how they're interacting and their relationship with it. If your child is doing well in school and your child has a good, rich social experience, I'm less concerned if they play more video games, again, assuming the content of it is fine, than someone who is playing less video games, but struggling in school and doesn't have these social um, uh, experiences that they should be having. So we need to look at the whole child. It's not just about the screen time, but we see what role it plays in it. Certainly kids with social anxiety are more likely to develop unhealthy relationships with screens, but we need to keep in mind that there's a bigger picture. We have to look at the bigger picture and that not all screen time is created equal. Um, and uh, finding that balance uh, within those screen times. Finally, I just want to point out anxiety, which is something that we uh, are experiencing more and more during this era of COVID. Um, you know, it's defined by excessive worry, intrusive thought, fatigue, emotional distress, irritability, difficulty sleeping. Those are the diagnostic criteria for anxiety. And you can replace the word anxiety with parenting. Excessive worry, intrusive thought, fatigue, emotional distress, irritability, and difficulty sleeping. And so we need to recognize that our role as parents and grandparents are anxiety promoting. They create anxiety. It, it's really a challenge. And certainly in the era of COVID with so much uncertainty, most anxiety stems from uncertainty and not being able to control the variables. Um, we have this increased level of anxiety and worry for our kids. Uh, we need to accept that we are not living in an ideal situation. It is way less than ideal, but I think there is a light at the end of the tunnel. We are definitely moving in the right direction. Restrictions are being lifted. More social opportunities are being created. 
Our dependence on technology is, is starting to become reduced because we can't connect in real time. And so um, there is a light at the end of the tunnel, but we need to continuously monitor our children's relationships with technology. So six suggestions for family success. Uh, screen activities should be age appropriate. Have tech-free time, go dark for dinner uh, is one example that we do in my house, but creating tech-free time, doing things without technology. Have clear and personal family rules. It's not just about rules for the kids, it's about rules for the house as a whole that we as parents need to abide by as well. So whether it's dark for dinner without technology or uh, really setting our, our phone down uh, at times. That doesn't mean that as adults, we have different responsibilities and uh, you know, need to, to uh, respond to that. But we can model healthy technology behavior. If we come home and we go to the basement and just binge on Netflix or uh, bury ourselves in our phone, that's not modeling healthy technology behavior. And our kids are going to follow suit. We have to promote non-digital activities, do things that don't include uh, you know, digital content, uh, whether it's taking your children. I, I've done in the last uh, couple months a lot of runs to the ice skating rink uh, just to make sure that my kids are doing something other than uh, being on a screen. Hiking, activities, um, we have to find that. But also remember that digital can be a shared experience. You can play video games, you can uh, be with your child and see what they're up to on social media as part of uh, a connection activity. And finally, uh, you know, we always have this internalized pressure to be perfect. We are not living in ideal times. And uh, sometimes when we seek perfection, it becomes the enemy of good. We just have to be good. We have to do our best, recognize that we're not living in ideal times, understand that technology is ubiquitous. It is, it is heavily part of our children's lives. And we need to do the best we can to help them regulate by understanding the social, psychological, behavioral impact and the role that we as parents can play and the role that our school community can play and the role that organizations like SBH can play in helping us navigate these challenging times. And I uh, wanna thank you for your time this evening. Um, I'm Dr. Ellie Shapiro, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Uh, and if there were any questions, um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, so, um, Miriam, do you want to? Yes. So we actually yeah. had a couple of comments. There were a couple of hands raised, but um, I'm not that I, I I didn't like I did send a note like tell me what you want. But there's a very interesting question. Somebody <clears throat> two two people put in very similar comments. Um, what about the fact that the new way of socializing for kids is FaceTime and playing against each other, playing games? Um, yeah. That's the new norm. Mom is concerned. Um, and another parent says very similar, that how to limit screen time when it's the only way we kids can socialize now. And really, you, you kind of did talk about it with the five C's, but yeah. if you could elaborate a little more. So there was a point where um, FaceTime was the only way uh, to connect. I, I think we're emerging from that. Um, and again, it, it's not ideal. Uh, you know, let's just call it what it is. It's not an ideal way to connect. Um, it's a great way to maintain relationships when there is a fundamental and foundational relationship that was established um, in real life. Um, even within screen time, within um, FaceTime or within Zoom, there is a sense of disinhibition or impulsivity as well. Um, and we want to encourage kids to maintain relationships and they can utilize the gift that technology is to maintain relationships, but it shouldn't be the only place. Your, your kids shouldn't be friends with people that they don't know in real life. Uh, that's not really what uh, you know, social networking and connectivity is for, and it shouldn't be the only platform by which they connect with people. So going back to that balance idea, there was a time that literally that was the only way to connect with other people. Um, we are not there anymore, thankfully, um, and hopefully we won't go back there. Um, but any opportunities that you can uh, have your kids connect with one another um, and, and go out, again, ice skating, when I took my kids ice skating, I encouraged them to bring a friend as well. So th these opportunities are friends on the block in the neighborhood. Um, but you can also utilize uh, technology because technology is a great way to connect with people. For example, tonight I'm talking to you via technology it's 
it's okay. It's not the best. It's, you know, but for the situation we're in, I hope that in a month or two or three, we can get together in real life and that will be a richer, more meaningful experience. So that's, um, you know, something to keep in mind. It was the first part to the question as well. Did I miss that? Oh, I think so. Yes, yeah, so somebody, okay, thank you. Somebody asked about TikTok. How do we supervise, use and create healthy boundaries? And that's a big one because TikTok is a little yeah. crazy. It, it, is a, it is a big one um, because uh, fundamentally TikTok, the, you know, to have preteens in, engaging in suggestive dance activities, um, I, I just don't think is appropriate. Um, you know, my own children, you know, Snapchat, Instagram, those were, you know, big when they were growing up. Um, and they weren't allowed to have it. And a lot of their friends had it uh, and they weren't. Um, TikTok is really uh, has taken by storm. It's harder for girls than it is for boys. Again, we talked about the idea that boys tend to use technology for entertainment and girls tend to use it for uh, social connectivity. Um, but as parents, we're always gonna find ourselves in situations where we need to make decisions uh, based on what I call the consequences of action versus the consequences of inaction. What's gonna happen if I do this and what's gonna happen if I don't do this? And this applies to technology, it applies to social media. There are certainly negative pieces of TikTok. Um, and you know, I don't know what the recommended age is for TikTok on the, uh, on the chats. And again, I would go to Common Sense Media just to get a feel for what the age appropriateness is. But then you're gonna make an informed decision as a parent. And um, you know, sometimes kids are disappointed with the restrictions that parents put on them. But often in hindsight, they are grateful that their parents put those restrictions on them. And so that's the question you're going to uh, frequently face. And it's not just around technology. It's going to be, you know, is, is your child allowed to play in the park by, you know, without adult supervision? Are they allowed to cross the street, but the other kids do cross the street? Uh, parents are always going to have to make those decisions of, um, of um, you know, the consequences of action versus the consequences of inaction. And TikTok is the same thing. Educate yourself and then make that decision. Okay, thank you. Uh, one last question, and I think this will be it. Somebody asked about music. Is music detrimental? And I guess they're, I'm assuming they're talking about music on screens as opposed to audio music. Um, you, well, I grew up you know, with, uh, you know, I, yeah. I remember MTV and all that stuff, which was plenty racy at the time, but I'm not sure what the parent means, but um, I guess either one. So, you know, one of the questions that you always have to look at is the broader scope of things. Um, I, I try not to get caught up like it's, you know, this, uh, you know, video game play. Should I let my child play video games? Should I let my child listen to music or watch music videos? So just assuming the content that you're comfortable with and, and the content's going to differ from, from family to family, from community to community. You know, what you might be comfortable with, I might not be, or what I might be comfortable with, you might not be. So let's just assume that as a parent, you've determined you're comfortable with the content, with the lyrics. The vast majority of audio music today, uh, I'm not comfortable with the lyrics uh, or popular music. I wouldn't want my children listening to it. Um, but then there is, let's just assume that we are comfortable with the lyrics um, and with the content. What it, role is it playing in their lives? Music is something that's amazing. It's enhancing. It's it, it you know brings joy and happiness in so many ways. Uh, but does it become something that takes you out of the environment that you're in? So, for example, if your children are walking around with headphones on their head around the house and not interacting or connecting with the family around them, so that it borders on rude, but it also is it's it's maladaptive social behavior. So, if the music is becoming that something that's maladaptive and and it's taking your child out of their social experience, then that would be problematic. Uh, if it's something that they use to relax and 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 you know, etc. Um, then I, I don't see a problem with it, assuming that you're fine with the content as well. So those are just things to, to think about. Look at the larger picture. It's not just, you know, I've had, you know, parents call me, uh, you know, my, my child wants WhatsApp, you know, uh, and it's innocuous for most of us, but in some communities, WhatsApp is like a big deal. Um, and, uh, you know, 
turns out the child is straight A student, they're doing well, they have friends, you know, so I'm less concerned about that than I am the person that has social anxiety and is academic failure, et cetera. So it's not that the technology in and of itself is good or bad. It is uh, as it relates to the specific individual and looking at the broader picture of their experience. Okay. Well, I think we've really learned a lot. Um, I, I think everybody here has probably seen a baby swipe. Um, uh, uh, it's really quite scary that babies under a year know how to swipe and touch and screens and so on. We've really learned a lot. Um, I wanna thank you so much for going through everything. This really was, and, and I, I had done quite a bit of research myself and I have listened to a lot of different programs, um, but this really gave us a lot of very real skills and tools and ways to be able to manage this really difficult time. And I wanna thank you. I'm, I'm getting a million thank yous in the chat. I wanna tell you, people really do appreciate this. Um, so thank you, thank you for the opportunity. It was thank you everyone for coming. Um, and you can watch um, SBH YouTube channel. Somebody did ask for the um, contract and I'm suggesting that people watch the channel. You'll be able to. I'm wondering if we might be able to get a copy of that. Yeah, if you email me, I'm happy to send it to you. Thank you. Okay, so you can reach you can reach out to me, Miriam at sbhonline.org, or call uh, SBH at, at the extension 304 and ask me for that, and we will send it to anybody who would like yeah, just it. Just one one caveat: the, the the contract. Don't use my contract. I mean, it, use it as a, a point of inspiration. But okay, it really. If you wanna, <laughs> right. It's about it's about the process with your kids. It's about right. having the dialogue and creating the contract together. It can give you ideas of where you want to go with your contract, but it really it should be a communication opportunity for you and your child. Right. And when we share that, we will put in those words. We will actually put that caveat in there. Okay. So we're going to say goodnight to everyone. Thank you again, Dr. Shapiro, so much. This has been extremely educational and helpful. And thank you everyone for coming tonight. Thank you. Good night.